Are they cool? Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I have three hundred two. What do you have? Okay. Uh, it is three hundred two uh, here uh, today uh, on the twentieth uh, of September, and we're going to call the Alamo Area MPO Active Transportation Advisory Committee uh, to order. Uh, Javier, would you do the roll call, please? Veronica Escalera Ibarra. Lyle Hofstetler. Present. Carl Bradmiller. Christina, coming in for Carl. Jeff Jordan. Cheryl Rogers. I am here. Carly Farmer. Here. Brandon Ross. Laura Parker here for Brandon. Joshua Dustin. I was good on that name. Javier, I'm impressed. <laughs> Isaac Levy. Yeah, Eric Tapp. Bill Hill. Allison Hayward. Ryan Clipson. Present. Burton Kell. <laughs> Joey Pollock. Here. Barbara Handy. Here. Karen Bishop. Alicia Spence. Messenger. Messenger. Yvonne Lena Rosa. Here. Marcella Diaz Wells. Here. Here we have a okay, we have a quorum. All right. Uh, we get started. Uh, do we have any citizens to be heard, Matthew or Javier? Okay. Uh, let's go to approval of the uh, August 9th, 2023 ATAC meeting minutes. I will entertain any modifications or changes to the meeting minutes. And if there are none from either the people in this room or online, I'll entertain a motion in a second. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a motion from Joe Pollock. Do I have a second? I'll second, Lyle. Thank you, Lyle. Um, all those in favor, let me do it a different way because with the online, it's always difficult. Unless somebody opposes the, the uh, motion the, and the second, uh, I'm going to assume that uh, w these meeting minutes are, are approved as submitted. Any opposition? One, two, three, four, five. No. Okay. <laughs> well, moving on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, it's the election to fill the vacancy of the A AMPO Active Transportation Committee co-chair. Matthew Moreno, cheers. All right, we're doing this presentation once again. We did this last month. Uh, today we will have to both nominate and elect an APAC co-chair, and this co-chair will specifically serve for the cycling or micromobility. Uh, so once again, ATAC chairs, uh, co chairs are every two years, and we select from our current membership. They are selected by the majority of those present at the meeting today. And this specific co chair will be serving for the cycling or micro mobility community. At this time, we will take nominations for any. From the floor, anyone present uh, for a current member to fill the remainder of the unexpired co chair term, which ends in January 2024. Any nominations at this time? Very short time frame. It's not that painful. <laughs> <laughs> if possible, I know our uh, ASVSA is uh, labeled as a pedestrian or walking organization, but uh, I'd like to. If possible, nominate uh, myself, Joey Public, uh, representing ASVSA and the bike head uh, <laughs> organizations. I accept the uh, the motion. Is there a second for Joey Pollock to be the uh, ACT ATAC co chair? I'll second Maricela Diaz Wells. Okay, get that, Javier. Sure. All right. 
All those in favor, or let me do it a different way, like I did on the meeting minutes. If you're opposed, please signify by saying aye. Otherwise, the motion passes. Was this just for the nomination, or this is just nomination? Yes, okay. just nomination. Okay. Now, Matthew, next. And next, we will have to elect our nominee into the ATAC co chair position. So we will need a motion to elect Joey Pollock as our ATAC co chair. And Joey can't nominate himself. I would nominate Joey, of course. Okay. Thank you, Bert. <laughs> so, Move it <laughs> along. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank you, Bert. Do I have a second for Joey's uh, nomination to be the co chair? Second, Ryan Flipson. Okay, that too. You can pick whoever you want out here. All right, same way as the as past, unless there's an opposition to it, I'm going to assume that the um, motion and the second are approved by this committee. All right, that's with that done. Next, we have uh, agenda item five discussion and appropriate action on the fiscal year 23 28 transportation improvement project tips call for projects and I don't have a name on this Matthew so I'm assuming it's you yes so this specific ATAC meeting is very important because this is one of the reasons that ATAC has started so that we can have active transportation input on our call for projects and scoring process and so today I'm basically going to go through the scoring process we used in-house at the MPO. Y'all will be able to give your comments and um, your discretion as to what rec the scores we recommended were. Um, we will be asking at the very end for y'all to make a motion to um, recommend these scores to the TAP scoring work group. And that scoring work group will be coming this Friday. So I'm going to be going over the seven different TA projects that we have, as well as the seven different scoring criteria that we use to give these projects their technical scores. I'll be giving you each of the parameters that we used as well and how we came up with those scores. If you all have any questions throughout this entire process, please feel free to stop me. There is going to be a lot of information today, so I'd be happy to. So Matthew, you're, you're making a presentation to the ATAC committee and for recommendations to the um, scoring committee. My question is, if there are recommendations for changes or modifications to your presentation by any members of the ATAC, that would be included with our recommendations to the scoring. Correct. Okay. All right, thank so you. So everything that I present today are MPO staff recommendations. If ATAC does not agree with those recommendations or wants to make any changes, you would say so at this point, whenever we are presenting, and we will make those changes uh, as long as there is pretty much a consensus along ATAC for that to go to the tax scoring work. Okay. I'm going to ask the committee to hold their comments until the, the Matthew's finished his presentation. Yes. Um, I will stop and allow any comments in between just because there is a lot of information, but at this time, we can go ahead and get started with our scoring criteria. This scoring criteria was approved by the TAC Project Scoring Work Group uh, a few years ago, and it comes with four main categories. These categories include addressing safety and comfort, increasing viability of multi-mobile options, improving system connectivity, and addressing transportation equity. And these four categories are weighted differently based off of the importance that that TAC Scoring Work Group saw. Back then, with safety and comfort having 40% of the points, increasing multiple angle of options at 20% of the points, improving system activity at 30% of the points, and in transportation equity at 10%. As you can see, we have different criteria for these four categories. For safety and comfort, we have two different criteria. We have the sidewalk and lightway facilities. And with that, we use FHWA guidance to determine the widths of those sidewalks, as well as what type of bike facility was used uh, within these projects, and the average crash rate, um, average severe injury, and fatal crash rate per 100 million vehicle miles. Um, so the MPO has recommended that we score both of those criteria equally for that category. 
there are a thousand points total that can be awarded. 40% of those thousand go to safety and comfort. 200 points for each question adds up to that 400. We, rec we pretty much recommend that system throughout the entire uh, seven categories, increasing viability of full-time full options. Those two uh, criteria are serving high, shift, high activity generators and congestion reduction, each of those getting 100 points. Improving system connectivity has 300 points associated with it, so we split them uh, 50 and 150 to if it improves the system connectivity and reduces barriers, and if it is part of an existing plan. And finally, the last uh, category is addressing verification equity. That by itself just gives 100 points. Do we have any questions at this point about this scoring system or any changes we would like to make to the number of points associated which, with each of the criteria? This is Lyle. I just had a question. When when was this scoring uh, arrangement? When did we come up with that? How many years ago? <laughs> well, um, well, kind of what we do each year is we revisit last the last time scoring methodology, oh, and so okay. this was, this was adapted from last year. I think the biggest changes are integrating the bikeway selection guide into this. I guess the comfort safety and comfort section. And so we've been using a similar rubric, I guess, for the last two or three project calls for TA. Um, as far as I remember, anybody can correct me because I've never that long either. Um, but yeah, we uh, we approved this. I think Tech approved this a few months ago. Um, yeah. in April. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if every every call you you do revisit it and, and review it to make sure that it's still relevant and appropriate. Absolutely. Okay, yes, sir. That was yep. my question. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Al. Any other questions at this time? Any objection to using this, these uh, maximum points for these scoring criteria? Matthew, you'll be, you'll be going through how y'all came up with these two. Yeah, yeah okay. yes, that'd be great. So uh, I'll go through each criteria and uh, the different amount of points that uh, were awarded based on those scoring criteria. So. Uh, first, Clifton mentioned that we did make a slight change to how we decided what bike facility was appropriate uh, with its context. And for that, we used the FHWA Federal Highway Administration Bikeway Selection Guide. Um, we basically, this guide is based off of two main principles that uh, motorists, drivers tend to uh, be more cautious and drive safer around a larger number of bicyclists, so safety in numbers, and two, that multiple sh studies show that the presence of low stress bikeways uh, positively correlates with an increase in biking. So with that, they make this graph that we use to uh, determine if the bikeway was appropriate for its facility. And it basically says that if a roadway has a speed of 35 miles an hour or greater, it should have a separated facility. Uh, that is a physical separation, not just a buffer. Or if there are about 7,000 vehicles or more per day on that roadway, it should also have a physical separated uh, bikeway facility. And that can include greenways or shared use paths as well. So for the first set of scoring criteria, looking in at safety, we're looking at the sidewalk and bikeway facilities. We have four different scoring uh, points that are available for this category. You can get maximum points. Those are for projects with the FHWA recommended six feet or wider sidewalks and a bikeway that matches the bikeway selection guide that was seen on that chart um, previously. If you match both of those, you get maximum points. You get 75% of the maximum points if you have a project with four foot sidewalks, but with a bikeway that matches that graph we just saw. Can I just add a clarification, Matt? Yes. When you're saying, and, and I should know this, but my mind's going blank, a six foot sidewalk for both pedestrians and bicycles. So, or is that a six foot sidewalk? With a separated bike facility. Separated bike facility. Okay. Um, there are times where vehicle traffic or speed is low enough that they can share. 
Um, we see that in say Hamden Square Park with that shared street. Um, but if it matches the FHWA bikeway guide and it says it needs to be separated, then they will be separated in these scoring criteria. Um, and we do six feet because that is the recommended sidewalk width from FHWA. However, ADA compliance is four feet. So since these are federal dollars being spent, all of these projects are required to be ADA compliant. So if they're between four and six feet, uh, they will be at most 75% of um, so again, projects with six feet or greater in width, but have a bike facility that does not match the FHWA bikeway uh, facility guide, get half of the maximum points. And projects with, say, a four foot sidewalk and a bikeway facility that does not match get 25% of the maximum. Are there any questions about these scoring criteria? And I just wanted to point out something because um, Matthew and I talked about this preparing the presentation. So he's listed kind of the our recommendation for how we distribute those like 200 points, for example, for this one. Um, but we do have our recommendation since we did keep it at 200. So if you all choose to change it, we also recommend that you if, if you if you adjust the number of points, um, we'll recommend you change the number of points to match that distribution. But it's up to y'all. Does that make sense? So, yeah. So, as you can see, we have seven TA projects that we scored using these uh, facility guidelines. The Brooks Green Loop has seven and a half miles of new shared use paths. Since it is a shared use path and off street facility, that qualified for the full amount of points. Um, same with the Civil Oak Creek, it is a shared use path under I 35 connecting to Stage Stop Park. The city of New Braunfels is looking to do intersection crosswalk and ADA improvements, and that includes a bike lane with a physical barrier, ADA compliant sidewalks, which means four foot sidewalks, and improved crossings at roadway intersections. While this does have bikeways that uh, match the FHWA guidelines, it only has a four foot sidewalk, so the maximum points it could receive was 150, and that is what we recommend. The city of San Antonio is looking to uh, improve pedestrian accessibility in school zones. Uh, with that, they're going to be making ADA compliant sidewalks, improved crossings at roadway intersections in school districts. Since this is only an ADA compliant project, it only received 25% of the maximum, which is 50 points. Uh, Bear County and UTSA connectivity improvements are three shared use paths connecting the UTSA. Uh, both north and south of Blue 1604 that got maximum points for being a shared use facility. The Green Road pedestrian improvements include a buffered bike lane and ADA compliant sidewalk. But this one's a little strange because at different segments of the corridor, it will have a 10 foot sidewalk, a 6 foot sidewalk, and a 4 foot sidewalk. So because of that 4 foot sidewalk section, it only qualified for the four foot sidewalk points, which is 25% of the maximum or 50 points. And let's see, it's pretty trail of shirts. It's a multi use path with pedestrian crossing improvements, another shared use path with a full amount of points. Any questions on how uh, we got to these scoring recommendations for this criteria? Matthew, yeah, uh, I think this is all making sense. Uh, it sounds good, but I guess for folks maybe not as familiar with the context of some of these facilities. Uh, do you all have a website set up where folks can go see a map, for instance, of where those are at? So or more details about the projects. We are developing a map right now in a, in a public friendly uh, base for all of these uh, TIP projects, and that will be available in October. So we don't have it right now, but in about a week or two, we should. Okay. And then we'll include all of the scores. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to follow up on what uh, Joe, you're saying, Matthew, could you send out that link to all of the ATAC members once it's ready? Yeah, okay. Okay, Yvonne? Yeah, adding on to what um, Joey said, um, it would be good to have like a map and maybe a typical section of the um, project and okay. then the scoring for viewing. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the website that we have are going to have the, the recommended scores that um, come from ATAC and TAC on that website as well. Um, so, so, yes, we'll be sending that out October 1st. 
a question. I think I got a little lost. Like I'm trying, I'm going back to the the categories, um, okay. the percentages, and I'm trying to relate them to how you scored. Are we purely looking at just the safety and comfort at this point? Is that what we're looking at? Yes, so we have seven different criteria um, that we scored on, and this is just the first of the set. Okay, that's what that's what I thought. Okay, I just want to make sure. So we're only looking at safety and comfort at this point. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so can you go to the next slide again? Okay, so what, why did you get, how did you get to the, can you kind of talk us, and I may have missed it because I was trying to figure, I was trying to look at this other. Um, yes. I was trying to make connect the dots. Um, so the one, 150, just give us that as an example, or 200, 200, how did you walk us through how you got to those points? So the 150, if we go back one slide. Um, 75% of the maximum, which is 150 points, is a minimum four foot sidewalk and the bike oh. facility that matches FHWA guidelines. I got it. So, this one includes a bike lane with a physical barrier, which does match those FHWA bike facility guidelines, but it only has an 80 compliant sidewalk, which means that it's four feet instead of six feet. So, it only qualified for that 75% of maximum. Uh, in order to get the maximum number of points, 100%, it needed a six foot sidewalk. So how did how did you use the the volume and speed table then? Where does okay. that come in? Exactly. So this volume and speed table was specifically for bike facilities. Um, everything in the dark blue. Um, was used to see if the bike facility that they were proposing in these projects was appropriate for the road or the most adjacent road that it was on. Okay, so is it a yes, no then for this one? Like either all or nothing? Um, not particularly on improvements where uh, say there is a low speed residential roadway it could have been a shared lane or bike boulevard, and there's a little bit more discretion on if that qualifies or not, um, depending on the type of project. We didn't have any in this call for projects. Um, most of the projects we got were shared use paths or AE improvements, so we didn't really have to deal with that at this point. But Okay. So that's why we're not seeing that scoring on the projects. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. It could be a project in a residential area that doesn't have bikeway facilities, but as long as it, the bikeway facilities they propose, such as a shared lane where bikes and cars are in the same lane, as long as it matches, <laughs> uh, then it gets it still qualifies for full points. So that means that we're then favoring um, bicycle lanes in roadways because because the, then they'll have the opportunity to get an extra two hundred points. Not necessarily. It depends on the speed and volume of the roadway. Um, but also that dark blue that's on the graph is for a separated bike lane, which is on street, or a shared use path, which is off street. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be on street separated facilities. It could be either. Do we have a question on that? Yeah, Jacob. Mm -hmm. Jacob? I had a question. Can you hear me okay? Yes, a little louder, please. Okay. Um, well, I was just sorry. I'm, I know I'm Johnny come lately, so I'll limit myself to one goofy question. But if you go back to the um, table, is there any way that a project could get points if there is some kind of um, public outreach component to? The concept, or if there are like accompanying changes to land use. Those are the two kind of specific, and I, maybe there's a history of that in the past, or just wondering if there's a way that that's counted for. So we don't have scoring criteria set up for the public involvement uh, point that you brought up, but for the land use, we do have scoring criteria for high activity generators. So that includes things like school parks, um, transit hubs, high density residential. So 
land use is accounted for in this, but uh, any sort of public involvement is not. We did have um, this is Clifton again. So we did have uh, project readiness screening questions that did include public involvement. I would basically ask the project sponsor how to describe how they've gone through public involvement if they've gone through any phases of NEPA. Um, so we did kind of account for that in the project readiness component. Also, once we score these projects, all of them will go to the public in October, like Matthew mentioned. So if they haven't been through public involvement before, they will go through at least our public involvement before they go into the tip. So. Thank you for that. Yes, sir. All right. Any more questions about the sidewalk and bikeway facilities? <laughs> Changes you would like to make to the recommended scores? All right. We'll go ahead and go on. Our next uh, criteria we looked at was the crash rate. This is specifically for fatal and severe injury crash rates per 100 million miles between the years of 2018 and 2022. Um, we decided that a roadway facility with 100 or more fatal or severe injury crashes per 100 million miles qualified for maximum points, 75 to 99.99. Fair injury for deaths was high, 50 to 74.99 was medium, and 25 to 49.99 was low. Uh, so those lined up directly with maximum points, 75% points, half of points, and 25% of points. There is one exception in this list, and that is this middle one right here, the Costa City of San Antonio Pedestrian Accessibility Improvements. That is something I would like to talk to y'all more about um, on this slide. But first, uh, with 100 or more accidents, uh, severe or fatal accidents per 100 million miles, the Brooks Green Group um, received a maximum score of 200 points. The Civil Overbreak Trail had zero severe or fatal uh, injury crashes. Uh, so they received a score of zero. The city of New Braunfels intersection crosswalk and ADA improvements had 39.53, which qualified for 25% maximum. Skipping down to Bear County and UTSA connectivity improvements, uh, 43.65, which qualified for 25%. Green Road at 37.51, 25%, and the West East Creek Trail on the shirts at 37.34, also 25%. For the City of San Antonio Pedestrian Accessibility Improvements, this project was not like the other ones. This project had dozens of project areas, meaning that it was nearly impossible for us to get a crash rating for the corridors that they were on. Um, and when trying to get a crash rating for the entirety of the City of San Antonio, we are unable to get a vehicle miles traveled number for specifically the city of San Antonio. The closest we can get is for Bear County. Um, so that is what we did. We used the crash rate for the city of San Antonio, but we used the vehicle miles traveled for Bear County, and that got us to 0.99. Obviously, that's comparing apples to oranges, and it's not the same as the rest of these numbers. So I chose and opted to use an alternate scoring um, for that city of San Antonio project since that data is unavailable. We go back to the slide. So with this, I included a little parenthesis with an asterisk, and I said that um, for ADA projects such as the San City of San Antonio one, if they're located within school zones, those would get maximum points, and that City of San Antonio project is specifically. Uh, dozens of ADA improvements within school zones all around the city. Um, for those within parks and regional commercial areas, so that would be at 75%. And for ADA improvements within neighborhood commercial areas, those are your corner stores and everything, those would get half of them. So that's how the city of San Antonio also got a maximum score because their projects, their ADA improvements specifically, are within school zones. Are there any questions at this time about how we got to these recommended scores or about um, those parameters? Yes. 
Yeah, on the that's the one for her. The TX one recommendation for taking cover with first rate for the year for 2017 to 2022. But then yes, it is it is 2018 through 2022. Um I made a mistake and just added or subtracted those, um, thinking that five years was 2017 to 22. Five years is 2018 to 2020. So it's actually 2018 through 2020. Marcella? I'm just curious if there was any precedent for this. So, you know, what did we do last year or the year before or the year before for this particular? So we did, uh, there is precedent for this. Uh, we have done this in the past before, um, but the scoring criteria, so that um, 100 or more severe or fatal injury crashes to 100 million miles, um, that was a little more lenient in the past. I believe it was somewhere around 137 in the past. Um, so it's a little more strict this year at 100. Yeah, and kind of what we do each year is we gather this crash rate data and then we look at the spread, you know, for that group of projects. Um, and then we kind of determine, you know, we break it up into looking at different bands of crashes. So Matthew just looked at the data and saw, hey, like, here's some logical breaks that we can apply to this um, and score them that way. Um, but again, those are up for discussion if you guys would like to. So. Um, I'm having trouble with the for me, it's because we're not in the department. From my perspective, just to be around the right small area to to equate, you know, a super high crash rate to something in a school. Usually, we get a lot of complaints about schools, but when you come down to the data, like they're not necessarily all that on the same groups all the other areas. So, I mean, I don't know here, but I'm having trouble seeing those two that like seem to weight under this category of of crash. Right. So my thought process with school zones being the maximum number of points is obviously, um, you know, parents and the community in general would like their children to be able to get to school, be safe getting to school, and, and to be able to have that access. Um, so we should be rewarding projects that um, are giving children the ability to do that. Um, so if that means creating sidewalks where there are none, even if they're not six foot wide, if they're only ADA compliant sidewalks, adding ramps. Um, those should be rewarded, uh, even if uh, there is no typical crash rate associated with those streets. Um, but of course, that's up for discussion, and um, if there's any disagreement, we can definitely change that score. Question on the, so, um, I guess, the second bullet point. Uh, Joe didn't actually to say, and uh, go back to the other side, please. So, uh, has and receives a part about how to be within parks, regional, commercial, for ADA projects. And I'm curious how that relates to, for instance, like the trail projects. Right. But I guess in theory, I think that some of these trail projects might be at least maybe not within an official park zone. But I'm just curious how y'all, like, you know, look at the Civil Creek projects. Um, how y'all came to that conclusion that came with the zero. Uh, so the Civil so the only time we would use those ADA projects, the alternate scoring, is if there is not a parallel facility. Um, that we could get a crash rate from. So the Cibolo Creek project is a shared use path adjacent to Evans Road. Um, so we used Evans Road as the crash rate since it would be building a facility for Evans Road um, across I-35. So Evans Road at that section has not had a fatal or severe injury crash in the last five years. So it got a score of zero based off of the data specifically. If it were an ADA project, um, say at the park or improving accessibility from a neighborhood to the park, and there were no alternate routes or, or best fitting parallel routes, then we may want to use that ADA project scoring guideline. Um, but since there is a parallel route, you use the crash data. Any other questions at this time for the crash rate? Um, 
Any questions or changes we would like to make to the crash parade recommended scores? All right, we will move on to pipe script generators. This is again bringing in land use. Land use is very important in the context of after transportation. So projects that serve pedestrian oriented land uses got maximum points. Um, and that includes high density residential schools or transit hubs. Projects that serve pedestrian friendly land uses, um, which are low density residential, regional retail parks or bus stops, got 75%. Projects serving uh, greater access in low density land uses, such as neighborhood retail going to your corner tour, got 25% of the maximum. And projects that serve uh, areas with land uses that are inhospitable, pedestrians receive zero points. That's not to say that those projects are bad projects. We're just looking for projects that will serve the most amount of people with this scoring criteria. Matthew, let me ask you a question. Yes. What is your definition of high density residential? I know with low density, it's single family, but what is your cutoff or your limit on high density residential in this uh, definition? So that is where we get some leeway with ATAC. Um, if there is a project that you know is up here and has, say, some duplexes around, and you would like to make the argument that duplexes, triplexes, some of that, mid, that middle housing, uh, qualifies for that high density residential, we could certainly do that. Uh, I believe none of these projects are around areas with a significant amount of, of middle housing. So it's generally the difference between an apartment block versus your single family house. Thank you. Um, so with this scoring criteria, um, all projects scored either at 75 or 100. We have a lot of projects that serve high chip generators this year. Um, the Brooks Green serves the Riverwalk, uh, Brooks Transit Center, uh, Walmart uh, uh, Hospital, and is supposed to connect to the Salado Creek Greenway in the future. Signal so Creek, since it uh, goes and connects to a park and connects under I-35, got 75% of the maximum score. City of New Braunfels is connecting the center of the hospital center, Schlitterbahn, Fisher Park, Land Park, Salms Park. We got the maximum number of points for the regional uh, retail and commercial centers. City of San Antonio accessibility improvements. All of their projects are in school zones that receive maximum points. Bear County UTSA connectivity improvements serves UTSA, the Layer of Corporate Office, as well as the Leon Creek Greenway that got maximum points. Uh, Green Road pedestrian improvements serves the Green Historic District, Green Hall, very popular dance hall and the Guadalupe River. Um, so that is some pretty regional uh, retail, so that got 75% of the points. And Westy, it's Creek Trail in Shirts, so there's a uh, Shirts Soccer Complex and their Community Center. Um, I define both of those as parks in this, uh, and so those receive 75% of uh, maximum points. Any questions at this time? Wondering if there's an opportunity to use uh, transit ridership as a measure uh, for connectivity. That is definitely something we could do in the future, um, looking to further define what connectivity is. Can that consideration be put to CAT for their scoring? Or I don't know what the score would be, but I can see any consideration regarding transit or that. So, um, those projects that connect to the transit hubs, such as MADLA, or in this case, the, the Brooks Transit Center, um, did get max points. But if they're at bus stops, like connecting bus stops to uh, the Greenway trails, it would get 75% of those points. So that was uh, the consideration. Of yes, that is what it's, going to Yeah, this makes it look like you're purely using yeah, land use. So, so is the... Can we review the transit hubs that, or what you identified as a transit hub? Uh, so the transit hubs are, are pretty much just transit centers. Um, so that's Mapa, North Star, um, Brooks, the Medical Center. If we have projects that connect to those transit centers, they will automatically get maximum points for increasing. Right. So there's, uh, but there's other, there's centers. other high high transfer areas like five points. Like I would consider that where there's a lot of high 
uh, ridership in transit areas. Uh, Macrela Small is another one. There's a lot of people transferring at that yeah. areas. Can we review that? What you used as a transit hub? Yes, it will most likely have to be for future proper projects, if I'm not mistaken, but then. Yeah, uh, we could use sure. a lighting and, and uh, data in the future to further develop connectivity to transit as one of our scoring criteria. Yeah. And yeah, but I'm not talking about the ridership. I'm just talking about what you consider a transit hub. So, because you, you came up with the definition of what you think a transit hub is, right? Right. That's what I'm saying. If there's if there's a way to add one more area um, connection to that, I don't even know. I mean, these probably all these projects probably maybe they don't even intersect with any of the what I'm thinking of. So maybe that's, yeah, that's, what, gonna, that's what I was going to ask you, Mari. Is there any projects that you think might intersect with something? Yeah, I hadn't. I I'm, I'm looking at them right now, and that that came to mind. Um, well, I'm thinking of UTSA. Um, High ridership there, money, and um, although it's not transit center, transit hub, but it's known as there's high ridership there. Mm -hmm. Is there a metric or a data point that, that you can use to say this point, this particular point in the city has high ridership versus like we know at the transit centers that you, you talked about with Brooks and everything, but you go to five points or, you, or you're going to some other area in town. Is there a metric that can be used to say, oh, wait, this is a high ridership uh, transportation point? Um, so we could, um, we'd have to get that data from VIA most likely, and it would, we'd have to discuss this as an ATAC group as well um, on if we would like to use a lightings as a measurement for uh, what qualifies as a transit hub in the future. Yeah. Um, but that is definitely something that we can look into. Yeah. And I, I understand what you're saying, Matthew, and I think part of the comments that I'm hearing is we want to evaluate that future because the, the that's, that's the projects are not in for those particular items and okay. locations. So for example, you may be using you're probably using Stone Oak, right? as a transit center and so you're you're putting the brick and mortar i guess uh part of the train of the transfer or the i guess it's kind of not thinking of the function right or the of transfers versus uh a facility because there's still areas in the city um that are have high transfers that that serve as a the same function as a transit center, I guess is what I'm thinking. So we need to just think about that also. Um, so I'm, I'll am i review this I, and, and maybe that's something for consideration that we can pass along comments to for TAC, but um, I, I just had that thought, thanks. I definitely don't think that we shouldn't like support Transit connectivity, like I think that's a good idea to give points to them, but I also don't want to punish communities that haven't built up kind of system. Right. So with these scoring criteria that we have before you, we have land uses and transit connectivity kind of bunched together in one uh, criteria. So if it serves high density residential, um, but say no transit. Um, it would still get maximum points for that high density residential. But if it had a transit center, but low density residential, it would still get maximum points for that transit center. So um, there are different ways to get maximum points with this current scoring criteria. Any other questions at this time about increasing the viability of multiple options? Any changes, requests made to the uh, recommended score at this time for this criteria? All right. Next, we have the congestion reduction. Um, so this is a measure that we use to measure the number of cars or the uh, amount of congestion along the corridor. So um, within this ratio, 1.0 or greater uh, is equal to a heavily congested corridor. Um, and so we said that 
projects that are along heavily congested corridors will get the maximum number of points. Uh, projects along a busy corridor or between 0.9 and 0.99 for that ratio is a busy corridor. Busy corridor. Uh, projects that are moderately used, so on a quarter of the 0.8 to 0.89, got 50 percent. And projects on a lightly used corridor, which is between 0.7 and 0.79, got 25 percent of the maximum. Anything below 8.7 did not receive points, as generally there uh, you do not feel congestion along those corridors below 0.7 with this ratio. So we have a number of different corridors along these project segments, along with their associated uh, vehicle count over capacity ratio. So um, the Brooks Green Loop does not have heavily congested corridors adjacent to their project areas, um, at least none that were over 8.7, so they did not receive any points at this time. The Cibola Creek Trail, uh, which was at Evans Road uh, under I-35, does have a segment uh, just at I-35 southbound uh, with a 0.91, which is a busy corridor, so they received 75% of the maximum. City of New Braunfels um, and the City of San Antonio are both ADA improvement projects, so they do not have a corridor associated with them. So instead of using a count over capacity ratio, you can go back and slide. We opted to use the alternate scoring once again. Um, so again, this comes back to that definition of transit hubs. Um, we said that if a project was near a transit hub rather than just a corridor, it would also be able to get maximum points. If it was near schools, um, it would be able to get 75%. If it was near commercial zone, it would get 50%, and any other would get zero. So using that, but the city of Montpellier had a number of projects within commercial areas, so they received 50% of the maximum score. In the city of San Antonio, uh, their projects are all within school zones, so they received 75%. Fair County and ETSA connectivity improvements. Uh, this is our highest uh, congestion ratio. Babcock Road from 1604 to Moth Road Drive. Um, that had a 1.3 congestion score, which is above one, so it received maximum points. Green Road, Hunter um, Road from Green Road to FM 306, scored a 0.81, uh, getting half of the maximum points. And the West East Creek Trail insurance did not score on this. Any questions about the count over capacity ratio scoring criteria? Yeah, so uh, Joe would actually say, what are you defining as corridors? Because uh, we're looking at a couple of these things about Brooks Green Loop or even Cibolo Creek Trail, uh, maybe on Brooks in terms of like that could be another connection to use instead of going on military drive, which right. I haven't seen the numbers, but I imagine I've seen military drive in that area. It's very congested and uh, at times, and it provides a very viable uh, alternative route for people going to walk or bike. And then the other question for like Cibolo Creek, for instance, um, if you're talking about you know, looking at those different areas, are you just, in that case, just counting Evans Road, or are you also counting the congestion of like a bisecting border with I-35? So we're only looking at parallel corridors with this. Um, so with the Brooks Green Loop one, you mentioned military drive. Um, none of the trails are paralleling military drive. Uh, one of them is actually on Sydney Brooks. Um, and so that is the count that we used, that traffic count on Sydney Brooks. It is a little bit off of military drive, and one could make that argument that people would rather take the Sydney Brooks route than the military route. Um, so we could talk about that and, and discuss points based off of that. Um, but for this, we use Sydney Brooks because those improvements are specifically on Sydney Brooks Drive. Um, and for the Cibolo Creek Trail, we do not look at I-35 when uh, discussing that. We are specifically looking again at the parallel route, which would be Evans Road. Uh, so, yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah, especially like thinking of the Brooks Green Loop, I mean, like I was in that area, I mean, I would not want to, if I live on the other side of 37, I would not want to bike or walk along military drive at all. So with that, you're being 
another pathway for people to you know get there outside of using the military drive quarter. Right. So, and I do want to say that we do have a scoring criteria for making new connections. Okay. Um, so we are rewarding points for making new connections, such as to the Slava Creek Greenway or under Isaac said. Um, but this is specifically for we want to reward projects that make space for pedestrians and bicyclists on those busy corridors. Because those busy corridors tend to have the most right-of-way constraints. Um, so we want to reward those projects that do make that space for them. In the future, when we come back, you're going to see Brooks because we have over 700 residential units on three separate projects that are all accessible off Sydney Brooks. Yeah. So yeah. that's future. One of them is under construction to Carolina. Uh, there's the old uh, base housing that was demolished, and they're going to put up duplex and stuff. But that all access is not directly to South, South East Military. It goes to Sydney Brooks. And then there's another project further west on Sydney Brooks. So there's a lot of projects coming, but they're not there today. Yeah. And then just not to get hung up on that too, uh, and you know, well, disclosure side, we have also partnered with Brooks on that application, but also that's uh, that project's along the border that includes the Via Transit Hub. Uh, so I'm just curious to get how that, uh, especially since it has zero points, how that's included in that yeah. process. And you are completely right. It is along the. Uh, there's the Brooks Transit Center. Center, so it does actually qualify for maximum points. That's why we do what we do here today. So um, definitely. <laughs> so it looks like that Brooks will qualify for maximum points when talking about the congestion reduction, um, even if those roads are aren't busy. Yeah. Although um, we do use that transit hub definition if no count capacity ratio is available. So if we would like to use that definition today, we would be able to, but generally, if there is a count capacity ratio available, we would use the ratio, which we do have. If we don't have that ratio, then we would use that transit hub definition. But if we would like to make that argument that we should include Brooks uh, with this, we can definitely do so today. Matthew, what are you saying? Account ratio? I can't hear. Account uh, over cap capacity ratio. Oh, uh, okay. So we look at the, the average annual daily traffic count along that street and then divide it by the length of the street uh, and the number of uh, vehicles over the last five years. Did anyone want to make a motion or, or a suggestion that we change the Brooks uh, from a zero to a 100 based off of that uh, transit center connection? I have a question. Um, I'm sorry before we do that. Um, you mentioned over the last five years. So, did you you included our COVID year for the congestion? Yes, it did include the COVID years. It was uh, 2018, 2018 through 2022. So I guess it would just be. I'm just trying to think through that a little bit. It would just be relative, right? Like it would just yes. impact all congestion, right? Yes. Okay. Just trying to think if there was any part of the city that may have experienced less congestion or more congestion during that time that might be uh, not be um, evaluated the same. I think it would be fine. I just had to think, or I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, it's, it's a struggle trying to decide whether to use old data yeah. or new data that we know has those those uh, inflections in it. But I think it, I think it would be relative. I think all the data would just be relative. Yeah. Like I don't think anybody any one part of the city suffered more congestion or not having congestion during that time. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Correct. I'll ask one more time. Did we want to change that recommended score for Brooks? Currently at zero. Well, I think we should have only because that's I can say it here is that that's the criteria. So right. the four near kind of plus is no account capacity ratio available. So and I do want to say that we do have account capacity ratios available. Um, but if we do yeah. support that at what period? 2018 through 2020. 
So uh, across from the transit center is a 400 unit multifamily complex getting ready to open up in six months. So, so we, I, would we I, like to take that into account today? Yeah. yeah. So we have to take action on if we change anything. Is that what you're saying, Matthew? Not action. Um, we would just uh, kind of come to a general consensus here right now, and I want that uh, change to the score on my end. And at the very end of our um, workshop today, I will show you the full project scores um, for what each project uh, scored. I think that makes sense uh, to change it. Change it to 100 for that transit center. Any objections to changing the Brooks score to 100? Good idea. Good idea. All right. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, Bert. I just want to, uh, to uh, again, I just want to top this too. I think it'd be good to just, I guess, uh, again, you know, thank y'all for you putting this all together. But I guess future cases, we get to see more of a clear picture on how this is conducted, or even how it's taken a look in terms of the corridors. I, you know, mission, like I'm talking about bricks a lot because I'm very familiar with that. Like, you know, other areas, uh, you know, for instance, the Shirts Trail and others that, like. I'm not familiar with it'd be helpful to have those maps to show, uh, especially as you know, like coming into this meeting, whether we had a package in advance, but it's really hard for us to score other areas that we're not familiar with and not having that information. Um, and also again, like defining how we're looking at corridors uh, in terms of like, you know, actual alternative routes, because you can say for instance, a military drive in Brooks context, you can add a security path or maybe a separated path. But still may not feel comfortable. So, like opening up this pathway, for instance, make it really more viable for people to want to walk or bike. Right. I think that's something we're trying to achieve with the TA uh, funding funding projects. So, just again, uh, you know, I know I'm a little biased speaking about Brooks and you know proposing that, but also you know, especially for other folks in the room who have projects uh, in other areas of the MPO that we're not familiar with, uh, just, you know, put that out there too. That would be much more helpful in that context to. Better advocate or maybe change those project scores. Okay. Um, so we can definitely look into making maps in the future. I do have the corridors listed out up here as well. Um, but it would definitely be a lot more helpful to be able to have a map open and see what part of town that is and, and what corridors are around. So we can definitely I think that you might want to do that for the TAC. I mean, they might. Because I, I know Beto and I were, were over here texting back and forth about things. We were like, we we're kind of, it would be, it would have been nice to have a, like an overview of each of the projects. Um, so maybe that's a consideration for the TAC is just giving uh, a once over of each of the projects um, or even giving them a handout so they can have some kind of context uh, visually or graphic, geographically where things yeah. are. So for our public engagement, uh, process in October, we are coming up with a, a one page flyer that has a, a map uh, with all of the projects on it and all of the corridors highlighted and in the number associated with what project it is. Um, I can see if we could get one for uh, those TA projects on Friday, um, just so it's a little easier to look at which projects are with which, um, if that would be more helpful for the TAC or group. We can try. Yeah, <laughs> I will do my best to get that. Get Clifton to help you. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry for the weather. <laughs> Sorry, threw you under the bus there. <laughs> so this one uh, is fairly easy. It's just a simple check mark. Um, you received the maximum of 150 points if your project made a new connection or upgraded a existing vulnerable road user facility. If it did not do so, it received zero points. An example of a project that would is the first project um, that creates seven and a half miles of new charities paths and connects under I-37. Uh, all of our projects actually did this at this time around. Um, if you are thinking about a project that might not make a new connection or upgrade an existing facility, that would be things like bike sharers that do not have any physical infrastructure or, or new bike routes that pull and include signage, those would not get those points here. But all the projects that we have this year um, did make a new connection or did upgrade existing facilities. So they all got the maximum points associated with this criteria. Any questions? Can you just, sorry, I'm asking another question. I realized I wasn't. Can you maybe give an example of a project that, that wouldn't meet? improved system connectivity? Yeah, 
Um, so say if the city of San Antonio did a huge project and they wanted to create neighborhood bikeways that were just bike sharrows and included signage saying bike route, that makes no uh, physical upgrade to the infrastructure, existing infrastructure. Um, it's purely just signage. So that type of project, while it may qualify as a TA project, it does not make uh, upgrades or new connections. Um, so that project would not qualify under this. That makes a lot of sense. Maybe in the future, just because everyone scored max, this could be an area that sort of differentiate projects in a different way. Okay. Any questions about these? Any other questions about these projects? Any changes we would like to make to this criteria? All right, we'll move on. Uh, this one is also just a checkbox. Um, if it's these projects are part of an existing plan, they got the maximum number of points within this criteria, which is again 150. Um, and if these projects are not part of an existing plan, it receives zero points. And I want to emphasize that projects that are listed within a jurisdiction's plans, uh, even if the alignment is exact, still qualify for this. Or even if it's in a different jurisdiction's plan, say. XDOT had a plan for this, but then the city of San Antonio went through with it, it would still qualify as an existing plan. So we have four existing plans that uh, we noted within this. Uh, the Brooks plan, the Brooks Green Loop, the Cipolo Creek Trail, um, the Green Road Improvements, and the West Deeds Creek Trail and Shirts um, were all part of existing plans. Uh, Although their alignments might, might not have been exact, they were enough to qualify for this and got maximum points. The New Braunfels and City of San Antonio ADA improvements were not part of any existing plan, and the Bear County and TSA connectivity, um, those shared use paths were not part of an existing plan that we saw. Any questions about this criteria? I'm just uh, wondering if we should put the word adopted in their adopted plan. That would be a little more precise. We could definitely do that. I think that's that's the spirit of it, right? You're wanting an adopted yes. plan, you're not. Yes. If it's part of an adopted plan, it's something that people envision for the future. Um, we definitely exactly. want to it's have that. public feedback, and that's somebody who's asking about public feedback. That's one way to check that mark, right? Is to say that you've had a plan that's been publicly um, approved or approved by some board or council somewhere. Right. And Matthew, this is Josh, uh, Coast of Planning. How, you know, uh, baked out do those recommendations within the plan have to be? Um, because we have some plans that are, you know, uh, may overlap with existing studies that the city has done before. We also have some plans that, you know, they're just recommendations and they do need funding and engineering. Um, so they have to be part of an existing um, plan specifically. If there was a report saying that we should look into this in the future, it generally was not counted as an official adopted plan. Um, one of the big ones for the city of San Antonio would be the comprehensive plans as well as those um, neighborhood plans, um, regional plans that uh, they did a few years ago. Uh, and looking at the projects that they would recommend within those adopted plans. But if, if it's simply just a report looking at um, things to look into the, into the future, um, it may not have gotten these points. Okay, thank you. And, and the reason I ask is because, you know, um, we've been working on the Pandera Road Corridor plan. We have phase right. one adopted and that contains a lot of multimodal recommendations. So. Uh, just kind of trying to see where those types of plans fit in, but it sounds like since that was an adopted plan, uh, that would qualify. Correct. As long as it's adopted and it's still not being curated at the time of sure. uh, scoring, then it would it would qualify. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions about the existing plan scoring criteria? Any changes we'd like to make? All right, we'll move on. 
This is our last of the seven scoring criteria used to score the TA projects. We have three different options here. The maximum number of points, which is 100, are or projects that are in or adjacent to both a minority or a low income environmental justice area. We define those uh, blocks by census block tracks. Um, so if you were in or touching at a minority or low income census block group, uh, you qualify for some of these points. We define minority as everyone except non Hispanic white population and low income was uh, people who had an income of 125% of the poverty rate or less. Uh, so with that, when we're defining the groups for low income, we decided that if we had a population that was greater than the regional average for low income, uh, you would qualify for those points. So if 19 point, if greater than 19.87% of your population was low income, you qualify for those points. Any questions about that? So we check both the minority and the low income population points. You got the maximum number of points here. If you check only one of those boxes, if you had a majority uh, minority population on one of your project areas, or you had a uh, low income population in one of those block groups, you got half of the maximum. If you had neither, you got zero of the transportation equity points. And so with this, we had a good spread again. Um, the Brooks Greenland population, uh, I do want to say that the project areas, um, the exact alignments were mapped out and we got a, uh, again, it's for touching the project area or adjacent to the project area. So for Brooks, it had a majority minority population, but the low income population was less than the regional average. So it only received half of those points. And the Cibolo Creek Trailer had a population just above 50% at 51.05, but a low income population that was lower than the regional average. So it received half points. The city of New Braunfels crosswalk and ADA improvements had numerous uh, project areas. And some of those project areas check both boxes. So they received the maximum number of points. Same with the city of San Antonio. The city of San Antonio has dozens of project areas around the city. Um, so they check both boxes. Um, Bear County and UTSA had a minority population of 73.84% and a low income population of 94.62%. So it checked both boxes getting next points. Both the Green Road pedestrian improvements and the West East Creek Trail insurance did not check the minority or the low income population uh, environmental justice areas, so they received zero points respectively. Any questions about this? Any changes we would like to make to the environmental justice scoring criteria? Finally, we have bonus points. Every project uh, in this current project fall, including CMAC and CRP projects, were able to earn bonus points if they overmatched uh, the, the local contribution they were required to get. They overmatched by five to ten percent, they received 50 extra points. If they overmatched by more than 10 percent, they received 100 extra points. PA had zero projects that gave an overmatch, so zero of them uh, got that, those bonus points. We only had one project, I believe, in the entire all our projects that overmatched. So that completes the project scoring workshop. I will pull up the final scores in just a moment, but I do want to talk to you all about the schedule moving forward. We have our project call workshop today, and the tax scoring work group will meet this Friday, I believe at 11 30. Yeah. Um, in this room to go over the recommended scores that we gave today for TA, and then we'll also be going through the CRP and CMAX scores as well. Uh, we will begin our public involvement period in October and run through that entire month. In January, we will also have a selection and approval of all of the uh, all for projects, London projects list, and hope for action to approve the TIP in May.
So I will pull up the final calculator and do the last one. And the only one that needed to change was right. Okay. Let's So this comes out to our final scores for the projects. Hey, it's Matthew. Yes. On column, I guess that's the H. The bottom two rows, the green road description is flipped with the shirts project. Yes, I'm I not think sure it, if the number was also flipped. No, the number is correct, but but the order that it was in did flip accidentally. Um, but those numbers and the points and descriptions associated with them are. Correct. Oh, wait. Well, because I think the green road is supposed to be. Yeah, for the. I believe the vehicle count and volume description was switched. But the points were the same. There they go. <laughs> Thank you. It's watching work. There. That should match up with the project that we're paying for. All right, going through road stock two maximum points for almost every category except the EJ populations at the very end. Um, so it received a score of 950 out of 1,000. Um, Civil Creek Trail received a score of 700 for their Sandy's path. Uh, they did not have a high crash rate, so they scored a zero. Uh, they did not go through any high density residential, so they only got the points from the state shop park, which was 75. Um, the vehicle count over volume was busy, but not congested, so they received 75% of the maximum. Uh, and they scored maximum points for new connections and existing plans, and received half points for the EJ populations coming up to 700. City of New Braunfels intersection crosswalk and ADA improvements received 75% of maximum for their ADA compliant sidewalk and facility type. Uh, point for a quarter points for their crash rate. They got maximum points for their hydro generators, half points for their count over volume uh, ratio, and that was because they were near commercial areas. Uh, Again, max points for new connections, no points for existing plans, and maximum points for EJ populations coming in at 600. But City of San Antonio got a quarter of the points for ADA compliant sidewalks, maximum points for being within school zones, 100 points for being within school zones, 75 points for being within school zones. Uh, they do upgrade existing connections on existing facilities that are not part of an existing plan. And have numerous projects within both minority and low income areas, so they received a score of 675. UTSA um, received max points for their three shared use paths, 50 points for their uh, low crash rate. University of Texas scored them their 100 points for their high tech generators. Uh, they also scored 100 points for their vehicle kind of the volume. Max points for the new connection, no points for existing plan, and max points for the environmental justice population. And the West East Creek, West East Creek Trail received max points for the multi use path, had a low crash rate, so about 25% of those points, 75% of the metric generator points for being within parks. Um, their vehicle count over volume was fairly low, so they received zero points for that. They are part of a new of an existing plan and make new connections. So both we'll max points for that zero points for minority populations. 
The green road pedestrian improvements got 50, uh, 50 points or 25 percent of the maximum because of their four foot sidewalk. A low crash rate got up 25 percent of those points as well. Uh, being within regional commercial got up 75 percent of the points. Because of their 0.81 um, for their vehicle count of the they received 50 points. Their buffered bike lane in the mix of four, six, and ten foot wide um, sidewalks got them max points for new connections and part of the existing plan, and they were not in the environmental justice area. 25 or 25. Any questions on how we got to these four at this point or any inconsistencies that we see? Can you just read the total points on each one again? Yes. Brooks scored 950. The Cibolo Creek Trail, which is the one that goes under I 35, 700 points. The City of New Braunfels intersection crosswalk and ADA improvements scored 600 points. The City of San Antonio pedestrian accessibility improvements scored 675 points. UTSA bike connectivity improvements that was submitted by Bear County uh, scored 700 points. The West East Creek Trail and Shirts scored 625 points. And the Green Road pedestrian improvements scored 525 points. Mm -hmm. Any other questions at this time about the scoring workshop or the scores at this time? Yeah, it's Joe again. And, uh, just for reference, I know we had a really robust discussion about, you know, obviously the different scoring categories, uh, but as of right now, for the TA projects, no project is at risk of being not funded. All projects should be funded essentially at this point, right? Correct. Um, I have reported here in the past, I believe last APAC, that uh, we have plenty of funding uh, this call for projects. In fact, we have about $24 million in leftover funds after funding all seven of these projects. So all seven of these projects are getting funded regardless of their score. Um, but it is still very important that we do this process and go through this process regardless. Hey, Matthew, uh, good job. I, you've really done well with this um, with this committee. I know you're, you're, you just took ownership of it and you're running it like if you've been running it. So I just want to tell you, good job, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Are there any other questions at this time? Um, just a reminder that we do need a motion in a second today um, to forward these scores to TAC as the ATAC recommended scores for the TA projects. So, Robert? Uh, I will entertain a motion and a second from committee members. Uh, whenever you feel like motivated to do it. <laughs> okay. I have a motion. Do I have um, a second? I don't know if everybody heard that you had the motion, but. Veronica. Yeah, but uh, I don't know if they heard. Veronica's, I got a motion from Veronica to ex make the, accept the recommendations from the Alamo or MPO on the scoring criteria with one modification from Brooks uh, and I'm entertaining a second. Like a second. And I have a second from Joey Pollack. Similar to the other action items that we've done earlier in today's meeting, uh, instead of taking a roll call vote for the people that are not, um, not here in this room, um, I'll entertain anybody who's opposed to this motion and uh, first. Hearing none, the motion passes and we'll move forward to the next item on the agenda. If I can ask some more questions here, this is kind of like in between, kind of more related to the tip. Uh, I know this has previously about moving to the CMAC projects, the bike pad CMAC projects, or the bike pad projects that were. Previous yeah, previous CMAC funding mm -hmm. categories. Is there still the proposals you ship those projects over to TA since as a math commission, there is that uh, there's a lot of amount of money? Or what is, I guess, yeah. what is the thought process on that? Yeah, Maybe. we're still missing things. No, you do, you Joey. Yeah, yeah. No, there's still money out there. <laughs> yeah, we're still 
We're still planning on doing that. We'll at least present a scenario to attack where we do that. Um, it's been really well received by them so far. Um, really, the, the main thing it focuses on is our uh, CMAC performance measures. Um, and it just leaves more of that money open for projects that have a bigger impact on air quality than bike pit projects. Um, so we're not going to defund any projects or anything. It's just moving funding from one category to the other. Um, and so we just want that flexibility, but um, we can claim the benefits of both bike bed projects, big or small, and other projects in our conformity. And so it's not really about that. Um, you know, it's something we learned recently, I think, is that we can apply those benefits still, um, but we do have that CMAC performance measure to worry about. Um, and so we just want to provide maximum flexibility and fund some, some more project types that couldn't be funded with TA, basically. So, yeah. Any yeah. more uh, follow up questions, Joey? Yeah, uh, okay. So what, uh, maybe I missed it. Maybe missed it. Uh, just a timetable for that possibly. All right. Um, it will be probably over the winter. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, I think three we'll, days. We do three Wednesdays at winter. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so I think we'll be able to present that. Um, we'll be taking this to the TAC in December for the first reading. And so I think we'll have that scenario prepared for them then just to kind of show what it, what we'll do, what we'll accomplish, um, what the funding will look like with those two scenarios. So. And the ATAC, maybe have a briefing on that too, just so that we're aware of like, you know, why it's, why the projects didn't score so well in CMAC and, you know, for us to also understand, yeah. especially for newer folks to the committee, um, like how are the scoring standards set up, which I'm sure those are all mostly federal mm -hmm. scoring standards for CMAC. Mostly, yeah. Okay, that'd be great for, I guess, general understanding of the committee. Yeah, for sure. We can definitely plan on doing that. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I was going to ask. Um, is that for this round of funding only, or would that be something that carried through to the future? Or are you maybe not prepared? Um, I guess really it's looking at this round of funding. We didn't, we kind of encouraged everybody not to apply for. Uh, CMAC or CRP funding um, for back then projects and nobody did. And again, we have leftover TA that we need to spend as well. Um, so we have a, an excess of funding, which is great. Um, but Agreed. it's really, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, it basically doubled our TA funding. And so we just have a lot more um, room to play around with. And so it'll, we're really looking at taking the currently um, Projects that basically haven't started yet that are still in the tip, we'll be looking at moving those from CMAC to TA, um, and we'll have to we still have to have a discussion and make sure that that makes sense from an administrative standpoint. But if anything, it should be less um, oversight by other other groups. <laughs> TA is a little bit easier to deliver than CMAC, but That's the big thing. yeah, yeah. But as far as our CMAC performance measures go, it, it could be where it doesn't make sense just to remove those benefits. So, um, but we'll present that to the TAC and kind of get their, their way in on it. Um, so the projects will stay the same in the same year and everything, um, but we'll just consider moving the funding from one category to another. So. Okay. Thank you. Good. Any other comments? Uh, otherwise I'll move to uh, agenda item six. Announcement and future agenda items. The next ATAC meeting will be held on October the 11th at 3 p.m. And Mr. Pollock will be co chairing that meeting since we're alternating. It's all yours, bud. Yeah. <laughs> you want to emphasize that this next ATAC meeting, the October 11th one, uh, is where we will be discussing and taking action on those uh, changes to the ATAC bylaws. So this is a very important meeting um, and we'll also be uh, giving options for uh, changes for those seven or so organizations that are affected by the current bylaws this coming January um, where they will have to be rotated out. So we'll be presenting and taking the action on that in October. Matthew, let me ask you uh, one follow-up question. Uh, Taking action uh, is, does it have to be presented one meeting and then voted on the next, or can we do it all in the October meeting? I looked at it. I be a one point. meeting. So, all right, and discuss take action the same meeting. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Do you want to do the other announcements, uh, Matthew? Um, the, sure. Our, the, our public engagement for the uh, fiscal year 25 to 28 tip starts in October. I've said it in numerous times throughout this meeting. Um, so whenever uh, we give our flyers out, our social media posts, um, those public meetings, I want to encourage all of your organizations to share them on social media, um, get engaged with those just so we can get as much response from the public as well as your organizations as possible as to uh, what projects you love or hate. Uh, also, the San Antonio Drive Electric Days are from 9 to 1 p.m. on Friday, September 29th, and Saturday all day on September 30th. The Friday event will be at CPS headquarters on McCullough, and they're going to be showing off uh, fleet vehicles, including light medium and heavy duty electric vehicles. The Saturday event is open to everyone in the public and will feature different makes and models of uh, passenger electric vehicles uh, where you get to view, ride, and test drive them. And that's going to be at the Boeing Tech Center, uh, Boeing Center at Techport on General Hub Mill Drive. Are there any other announcements anyone would like to make at this time? Yes, this is Lyle, and um, I was hoping to get you before you started, but the Friday event, unfortunately, we had to cancel. It was a last minute decision we had to make yesterday. It wasn't easy, but there were just some circumstances that kind of came together in a perfect storm that caused us to postpone it. So the Friday event is not happening. Please don't come to CPS Energy Never Friday. <laughs> but definitely come out Saturday and see us at, at Boeing Techport. And that's all I have. Lyle, this is Bert Patel. San Antonio. Has that already been changed on the website? So we didn't really advertise the fleet event publicly since it was really just targeted toward businesses, governments, and those. those I, I know so. that the, uh, what is the SA Drive, the electric, that website. People register. I didn't know if that got changed or not. No, so that's not changing. That's that's for the oh. Saturday event. So that's that's still on just as advertised. Yes. Yeah, I've been I've been to that and it has maps for the test drives and not only of the the electric vehicles but for e bikes as well. Yes, so. and um, I I and I'm glad you mentioned that. I wish this year we're not going to have e bikes available since we're not. This was from a different location. It wasn't logistically possible this year. Well, but that's not available. I would say. Yeah, but. unfortunately, just just the e-bikes. But yeah, the Saturday event is still on as planned. So what what you see online is still valid. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, keep on. Is it okay if I steal the screen so I can do my announcement? Sure. If Javier would let you do it. Okay. Carly, did you have an announcement too? Will be next. While Javier is pulling that up, I'll take executive privilege and make another announcement. So, our uh, scoring workshop for TAC, I know I'm not executive, Robert, don't bring it up. No, uh, no. no. <laughs> I said, don't tell me you're leaving too. No, no. <laughs> hey, hey, hold on. <laughs> Uh, no. 1030. Not that. Yes, it's 1030, not 1130. Not so, and it's technically a special meeting of the tax. So we invited the whole tax, posted the meeting to the federal, not the federal, the, at the courthouses on the Texas register, all that stuff. So it'll be an open meeting. Anybody's welcome to attend, um, but we'll have our tax members deliberating and voting. So will you be able to participate online like this? Yes. Okay. Yes, we'll have online. It's there. All right. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Posted yes. on our website. There we go. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So TechSpot has a, a district bicycle plan public meeting going on. Um, it's been open since September 7 and um, it closes on October 9. And so we are just um, requesting feedback on some um, routes that we've identified as high priority as well as routes that we have um, identified with a uh, network function type. So that means kind of um, we've analyzed our on system roads and we've identified um, the type of user that will be using those routes. And so um, if you write on these routes, it'd be good to kind of let us know hey, um, on this route, um, we'll probably see a lot of daily travel. It's more of a, a trail um, type of travel. So comments like that, it's what we're seeking. 
and um, I can share this with um, Matthew so he can share with you all and it has the QR, the QR um, link to the survey. And um, you could also just Google um, bi district bicycle plan and it should over our textile website and you should be able to access the uh, survey. Yvonne, is that a heavily traveled bicycle wrap from San Antonio to FAR? Um, no, so only four districts are participating in the um, bicycle plan, but um, FAR is participating in Laredo. Way to ride a bike. <laughs> The access road. Well, Carly, the city of New Braunfels is hiring a transportation planner. Tell your friends. <laughs> Who left? Lauren. Oh, really? Where'd she go? City Center. Ah. She switched to the dark side. Yeah, she did. Yeah. <laughs> Those Campo people. So, so when you see her again, tell her that what we said that this committee went to the dark side, went to the Austin keeper, go to the Campo. Campo. <laughs> Joshua? Yeah. 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 Thank you all. Um, and, and I mentioned earlier that we, you know, we've adopted the Bandera Road Corridor Plan Phase 1. We're um, a couple of months into our existing conditions report for phase two, which is a future land use plan, including multimodal recommendations between 410 and uh, Culebra Road. So that's inside the loop. I uh, just wanted to give you all kind of a heads up. We're probably about two months out from finishing our existing conditions report, but um, I'll touch base with you, Matthew. And I did want to uh, share my email address here in the chat. Of course, it's on the agenda and invite as well that if anybody did want to participate in those meetings or sign up for uh, our email list, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. I will be reaching out to this group kind of as we wrap up that existing conditions report, but just wanted to put that out there. I think this is obviously a great audience for that. So um, thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Stella. Um, so we, uh, Bia just kicked off a network redesign uh, study. It's a network evaluation uh, study. We look at our current transit service and then we try to look at it holistically um, to come up with recommendations for future planning. And so I just want to make that announcement. We're in the middle of developing goals um, and we are also forming our TAC committee. I may have already, some of you I've already reached out to. Um, so we should have a TAC committee meeting sometime in October, late October, and then we should be doing, we're planning to do public engagement uh, starting next year. So I just, and we'll come to this meeting or we will uh, do a proper introduction of that, um, of that project at this meeting and then at TAC also we're planning to do that. So keep us in mind for an agenda um, item. Thank you. Thank you. I have one more. Okay. And I have one comment after that. All right. The National Park Service has reached out to the Alamo area MPO and they are beginning a transportation equity plan for the missions on the south side of San Antonio. They will be holding a focus group, uh, two focus groups, both on October 11th. If you're studious, you know that that is also the date of our next ATAC meeting. Um, so, unfortunately, both of the times for both focus groups overlap with the time of our ATAC meeting. Um, but they have a day two workshop, which AMPO will have a presence at from 9 to 5 on October 12th. Uh, I will share this flyer with every, everyone just in case you would like to RSVP. Um, it is a full day workshop on the 12th. Uh, so, if you're interested in improving, uh, transportation access to the missions on the south side alongside the National Park Service. Um, please RSVP. Uh, for future agendas, I, I think it's been a, a little while. I'd like to get an update on the city of San Antonio's bicycle master plan status. They've been working on that for 
over a year, I think now, and it would be good to see where that is for this ATAP committee, just to get an update. Matthew, I'd be happy to help make that connection if there's nobody in the audience today. Okay, thank you, Josh. Thank you. No problem. And I leave that to Matt. Um, All right. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, so a few updates from ActSA. Uh, mentioned previously that we're uh, working or building a complete streets coalition with a shared goal of adopting uh, and working with our city partners to adopt a new complete streets policy for the city of San Antonio by June 2024. Uh, so right now we're meeting in the last Tuesday of every month. So next Tuesday is our next meeting. And so essentially these meetings we're going over uh, what does it mean to create a new complete streets policy? Why is that needed? Um, and, you know, working with our community partners to you know, do some asset mapping or some from other folks we need to bring to discussion. I see some folks on the screen from uh, community partners, to maybe some local governmental partners who would be a part of the discussions to help make a really robust, great new complete streets policy. Uh, so if you're interested in participating, let me know. Um, also, actually, I say we're partnering with the uh, Texans for Reasonable Solutions, uh, hosting a happy hour discussion on housing on October 5th at the Good Times. And share that flyer with y'all too. And also, what was the purpose of that one, Joey? Uh, just again, connection. I mean, broadening the connection with you know transit or you know transportation and housing. Uh, you know, there's conversations about Brentwood Sevilla's ART corridor. I mean, there's discussions about loosening up even a uh, uh, land use regulations to allow uh, maybe more transit oriented developments. Uh, so I think it's also timely to have these discussions, maybe a little more state. Focus policy, but there's a lot of those connections on how we can, you know, get people closer to our streets and transit corridors and more. Um, it's a great conversation, especially since often a few months ago, I believe two months ago, recently uh, deregulated single family housing and allows duplexes and triplexes on all of their flats. Um, so that increases viability a lot for transit as it increases the population density. They also have a very active accessory dwelling unit, which in the spring of 2022, uh, the technical advisory committee for the planning commission, we uh, incorporated some uh, provisions in the development codes to allow for accessory dwelling units here. So it goes back to my question earlier, years ago, back in 99, 2000, when we were trying to do a light rail initiative here in San Antonio, um, the metric that was used was residents per square mile. Whether that's a metric, as we talked about, for scoring or not, because a square mile is 640 acres, it's maybe a little broad, but it is a metric that's fairly wide and used in planning circles. Um, yeah, so it's the new metric for urban area. That's why it has such an urban area shakeup. Yes, with them. Anyway, so just you know the day and time? that's on October 5th. Um, should be 5 30 at the good kinds and i can share that flyer with matthew and uh, again we're partnering with there's a statewide organization called texans for reasonable solutions they've been lobbying like the state officials uh, so they're working on you know building their relationships locally so we're partnering with them and also another group strong town san antonio but again just bridging those connections with transportation sure. and bringing more access people to get to where they need to go if you have a flyer you would like me to share with everyone after today's meeting please email it to me and i'll send out a mass email with all of the flyers for everyone, as well as the, the final scores that we uh, recommended today. Thank you, Matthew. I have two more to drop in too. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. I'm trying to speed it up here. Uh, just a couple other things here too. Uh, and I guess the advocacy world also partnerships. I think when I was at Ampo, this meeting was open to the other folks, but there's a group called the Texas Streets Coalition. Yep. It's largely a group of uh, advocacy organizations across the state of Texas who are working together to maybe work on reform throughout the state or you know, working for better policies. It's largely a bunch of like advocacy organizations, but I think essentially there's different partners who are interested in dropping in, providing some insight that that's possible. Uh, I can provide more details on that, but just letting folks know there's this organization that exists, or this coalition that exists, and they have a website too. And, uh, they had a planning retreat two weekends ago in Austin. Two weekends ago in Austin and working on how to be more effective and also bring in more groups from across the state. So I can provide that link with Matthew if anybody's interested. And also a shout out for our nonprofits. Uh, also, actually, I say there's the big give going on for the next two days. So uh, after I say is participating for the first time. 
uh, but also there's a lot of other great uh, local nonprofits participating in Big Give. Uh, technically, it officially runs from 6 p.m. today through 6 p.m. tomorrow, but it's also open early for anybody who's well interested in donations. And if you're not able to donate, uh, please share uh, details, whether it's for us or other nonprofits in the area who are looking to get donations. Hey, Joe, can I have one follow up questions on the complete streets? The city yes. adopted a complete streets policy a few years back and uh, is this was a council approved policy that yes. adopted. So what you're going to do on your you're, you're going to update it, bring new elements to it and yeah. you have to go back to the council. So who's greasing the wheel at the council for you? So actually the mayor is very supportive uh, yeah. early on before we start this coalition. Uh, Mayor Ron Mayor, uh, he was very supportive and wanting to make this happen too because uh, yes, there's a policy path from 2011, but it's also an outdate for today's standards. If you look at an organization called City Health, um, they use metrics uh, provided by Smart Growth and Smart Growth for America based on their complete street standards. And Smart Growth from, uh, City Health uh, has essentially they have a full grading system from housing uh, access to complete streets in other areas. And currently, City of San Antonio does not have a score. We do not have a medal because they give like bronze, silver, and gold medals for policies. And currently, the City of San Antonio's complete streets policy does not have a medal to this yeah. based on current standards. And uh, props to the city's transportation department, uh, the interim director, Kat Fernandez, and her team, they're also actively looking into uh, how to create a better policy on their side, too. So they're actively working on looking how to work on that as well. And we're also working with other city departments to make it a good comprehensive policy. So are you looking for people from the private sector to participate in the complete streets committee? If you are interested, yes, uh, it's kind of expanded from my like, public sector folks to some yeah. folks who work for some consultants too, are part of it, but also even the community folks, uh, you know, community groups, especially. All right. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Madison had a great idea or Madison Sella had a great idea of creating an active transportation community calendar. That is yeah. definitely something we could look into in the future. Um, I do like the idea right now of, of getting all of these uh, events and then sending out uh, and a separate email after the ATAC meeting with all of the flyers for those events so people who are interested um, can sign up. But if, if it becomes a huge issue in the future, we can definitely create a calendar for all of these events as well. Or nonprofit can create a city. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments or announcements from anybody? If not, it is uh, 445 uh, and I'm going to adjourn this ATAC meeting. Thank you all. <laughs> I'd just like to get it done before 5. <laughs> Good job. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Bert. Yep, we'll see you guys. Right, man. There's a lot of them.